I'm gratified. I'm gratified that I have an opportunity this evening to share some of my thoughts and, more importantly, to hear from you. Now, uh, just to set the record straight, there were no several reasons why I left practice, legal practice, at the end of 2010. It was simply this an increasing sense that the judiciary, which in every jurisdiction is supposed to be the final bastion, that preserves the fundamental rights of the citizenry, no longer serve that purpose. I could no longer, in all good conscience, go to court, bow, and if you say in Malay, young Arif, it means, oh, wise one. It didn't hold. I'd also reached the point where I felt, in fact, I'd reached that point a couple of years before that, that if, if we were going to take the nation back, take the institutions of state back, restore the fundamental liberties that were guaranteed under part two of the federal constitution, there was no shortcut. I'm no Barisan national had to go. Uh, I still hold to that view. And, um, I will try to share with you my thoughts very quickly on why I think that is the case. 1973, especially for the, for the, younger, the younger ones here, you may or may not know this, 1973, the Prime Minister then, Tun Abu Raza, following on the, well, they say race riots of 1969, many of us today are convinced that it was very much contrived. It was very much contrived, but we can go on debating about that till the cows come home, so we won't go that way. 1973, Tun Abu Raza came up with the new economic policy. Whilst noble in its aspirations um, to eradicate poverty and to end the identification of vocation with ethnicity and to reduce the gap between the haves and the have-nots, noble in its aspirations, uh, you, you may or may not know, and I will perhaps try to, to, to illustrate for you, things went bad. That was 1973, the launch. 1974, an all-important year, Petronas was created. That meant Malaysia was now part of the, nation, the, the oil-producing nations of the globe, 1974. Now, in 1973, this is government statistics 50% of the population was categorized as living in poverty. Forget about, forget about the racial breakdown. 50% lived in poverty. 1974, we are an oil-producing nation. From 1974 to 2009, that's 35 years, we have to speculate as to how much was derived from the oil and gas industry and went into the federal coffers. Why I say speculate? Because the act that created Petronas also provided that the accounts would only be tabled before the Prime Minister. So to this day, to this day, we have never had the fullest details of how much that industry <coughs> generated. But if you go to Barry Wayne, the late Barry Wayne's Nation Maverick, and try to draw data and information from that book, it is estimated that something in the region of two to three trillion <coughs> went into federal coffers from the oil and gas industry. That's a huge amount of money. And if the new economic policy had been implemented and administered <coughs> faithfully, we would have expected that Malaysia rather than Singapore would be the world's richest country per capita, as was announced last August. Now, the government would have us believe that through its efforts, poverty has been eradicated to a point where only 6% of the population live in poverty. And if that were so, my friends, I would not be standing before you today. How they arrive at that figure is by tweaking the poverty line indicator, PLI. Now, they would have us believe that a family of five living in Kuala Lumpur 
with a household income of 764 or more is not living in poverty. 764 for a family of five in Kuala Lumpur, when you address the eight basic household needs, you are not poor. You're only poor if it's 763. Now, the moment you work it out to a more realistic 1,005, and I'll tell you this, friends, 1,005 is scraping the bottom of the barrel. It's, it's difficult to make ends meet. But if you took it to 1,005, your poverty line is up now to 40%. And if you took it to a more manageable 2,000 ringgit a month, you're looking at 50. So your, the question one has to ask is this. From 1973, with a new economic policy and petrodollars coming in, flowing in, why is 40% impoverished? Now, my activism did not start with a focus on the poor. Um, I was drawn, I was drawn into activism because of my concern manner in which the, the guarantee on the right to choose and practice one's religion of choice did not apply if you were born a Muslim. If you elected to leave the Islamic faith, Article 11 vanished. Uh, but I, thought that I, I, I took up the case of the four apostates in Kelantan in the year 2000, very naively thinking the law is pretty clear cut. Uh, Article 11 says every person has the right to profess and practice his religion. And it should be open and shut. The High Court told me otherwise. Okay, one judge makes a mistake, I took it up to the Court of Appeal. 2003, the Court of Appeal told me I was talking utter rubbish. We had one more shot, we took it to the Federal Court, 2004. I have never seen the kind of legal gymnastics I saw in the highest courts to deny the right to choose one's faith. Four individuals were required to serve a term of imprisonment of three years. They, of their own free will, had chosen to no longer profess Islam, but were dealt with by the Sharia courts applying Sharia law. Right, so, by then, I had already lost confidence in, the, in any due process in the courts when it came to constitutional issues. I turned therefore to social reform. Uh, we, we tried to initiate the interfaith commission efforts <laughs> over a period of four years, culminated in a national conference in February 2005 with representations throughout the country, well received by delegates the following morning, Amno Youth sends a memorandum to Prime Minister Badawi to say, if you countenance this effort, there will be hell to pay. And Badawi issues a statement to say the nation is not ready. The nation is not ready for interfaith harmony. By golly, that's 2005. By 2007, it became abundantly clear to me personally that if change was to come about, it had to be through the political process. And that has been the, the efforts of me and many of my colleagues over the last six years. Through Bursay, uh, through Saya Anak Bangsa Malaysia, although many say it is not political, I say if you, if you move to bring about substantive change, it cannot be anything else but political. Uh, then there is the argument that, oh, okay, but it is non-partisan. And, and I think this is an important point that needs to be addressed. What does one mean, mean by being non-partisan? Um, Abu, anything but Amno, they say you are pro-opposition. That is not true. I am partisan, but I am pro-people. And it is for that reason I do not hesitate when the need arises to slam the opposition if the position they take does not augur for the interests of the, especially the 
Um, but where have all these efforts at change taken us? Bursay, I was part of the Bursay Steering Committee. Many of you will recall, I think, uh, even here in Australia, there was solidarity with the efforts in Kuala Lumpur when we uh, rallied on the 9th of July. That was Bursay 2. Bursa two. Now, my concern has been this. If you were advising UMNO and Barisa National, would you not tell them that if you gave any of the reforms that the people are demanding, that would spell your own death warrant? Because it would simply mean the very premise upon which UMNO again and again and again wins at the ballot is being diluted by themselves. Now, you must remember this, and many of you may not know this. UMNO Barisa National took 48% of the popular vote in the last election. But what's more important is this. The 112 seats that were required to form the bare, min bare minimum minority government was garnered with just 20% of the popular vote. All right, and as, as I think the, the explanation you will find is the criticism that you that appeared in Canberra Times on the 26th, when they castigated your prime minister for his apology, for his previous criticisms of the Malaysian government. And they summed it up this way. They said the Najib administration won the election on a gerrymander. And that's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, on a gerrymander. Putrajaya, 6,000 voters must decide who the MP is. 30 kilometers further, Kapar, it's 130,000. Why? Because Kapar is patently opposition. And that's how it translates into the final result of a mandate to rule with just the garner of 20% votes. Abe Lincoln's government of the people, for the people, and by the people, down the toilet bowl in Malaysia. And, and we cannot pretend that it is anything but that. Now, I have to be candid. I have to be candid and concede that we were not just cheated by Amno BN, but we who opposed Amno BN also let ourselves down. The efforts by Abu whilst I think we had our strategy right, came a little too little too late. The principal effort on our part was to take the message of change into the Malay Um It was not enough for this reason. We had a very powerful media team that came up with excellent material, but due to resource constraint, human as well as financial, we could venture in perhaps once a month, once in two months. Pa Ali in the kampong, in the villages, receives a daily dose of arsenic poisoning every morning after his Friday prayers when he opens to South Malaysia. And another dose at 8 p.m. when he watches prime time on TV3 and RT. How do we fight that? How, how do you fight that when you go in once in two months trying to bring in the truth? You know, we, we hear this adage often enough. A lie repeated oft enough becomes the truth. And so there you have Pa Ali in the, in the, in the kampong after his Friday prayers reading in Utusan in Malay. I'll translate it in English for the benefit of others. The Chinese are trying to take away what little the Malay have. Right? And, and there he goes, he scratches his head and he asks his neighbor, Asing, the Chinese, hey, what's going on? And Asing says, ah, you know the city folk. All right? So it, it doesn't affect race relations. And I personally think we do not have a race relations problem on the ground. We get along very well. But what it does is it plays on Pak Ali's psyche. Enough so that he makes a mental note that come polling day, he gives his vote to him. And that's all they want. Please understand this. Amno Barisan National do not want to see 
a nation torn to smithereens because you can't milk the economy then. All right, so it's not in their interest. It suffices if pa Ali's state of mind is that he should give that vote to Amno again. Now, that was our failing Amno. The opposition, the opposition failed us. We urged the opposition leaders that this election put party interests aside. That this time be leaders of the people and not just leaders of your respective parties. It was imperative, especially in Sabah and Sarawak, that we did not see three, four, five, six cornered contests. Our intelligence reports from our operatives on the ground was that the mood for change in Sabah was so strong. People were ready for change. But there is also this paranoia. There is also this paranoia that if I vote for opposition, but BN comes in, they are able to identify how I voted. Now, if you are a civil servant, Concern is you get transferred from Kota Kinabalu to Kota Marudu or some what forsaken outlying Bundo. If you're a pensioner, <laughs> bizarre as it may sound, the concern is my pension can be cancelled. And if you're a class F contractor enjoying some small contract cutting grass from the municipal council, your concern is the contract will be cancelled. So whilst they were prepared, because the mood for change was so strong, they were prepared to take a chance. They were only prepared to if they saw straight lines. Now on nomination day, Sabah turned out to be a disaster. And as things turned out, our, our intelligence reports was that if we got it right, we could take eight of the 31 seats in Sarawak. We only managed six. But I'll tell you, if you understand the logistical nightmare in Sarawak, six was a very good result. Sabah, with 25, our intelligence reports was we should take 14, if we got our act together. We only managed three. And in Samananjo, we were supposed to take 99. Now, if you, if you look at the, the results, the, the, the variation in Peninsula has not been significant. And that tells us really the battle to be fought. If we are going to take this battle into GE14, it's in Sabah and Sarawak. You win Sabah Sarawak, you have a fighting chance of taking Putrajaya. Now, GE14, are we going to see a GE14? I'll confess that we are very closely monitoring the state of the economy. There have been, I think there was a report in Forbes about two weeks ago, um, and there are many others. The concern is whether the economy is going to bottom out even before we see GE14. And I will tie this now with a lot of the post GE13 I'll call it state-sponsored polarization that we are witnessing. The Allah issue. We've just seen the Allah issue. And curiously, the federal court, the Court of Appeal, fixed the date for decision on the eve of the Hari Raya of Haji holidays. Now, one wonders why. You know, you talk about sensitivity. Now, why? On the, uh, in the early hours of 6 May, when the election results were announced, Najib on the one hand talked about a time for reconciliation and in the same breath um, lamented about a Chinese tsunami. And we've, we've seen, we've seen over the last couple of months an incessant play more these days on religion rather than race. Because in my opinion, uh, they've begun to feel that as far as the Malays in the, in the urban are concerned, they've lost that hope. If you recall, if you recall the High Court decision on the Allah issue, 
That was delivered on, in December 2010. You will recall the spate of church burnings that followed and the desecration of mosques by the tossing of pig heads into the compound. Now, our investigation patently points all of this to contrivances by UMNO to, to, to uh, engineer tension between the races. On the 8th of January, there was a call, it was a Friday, it was a call for protests after Friday prayers at the National Mosque and the mosque in Kampung Baru, for those of you who are familiar with Kuala Lumpur. Now, we had our people in both mosques to see what happened. And as the, those who finished their prayers came out and were confronted by these who were calling for demonstrations, they scolded those and said, why are you disgracing Islam? All right, look, the point I'm trying to make is this. UMNO is not able to con the urban Malays the way they used to be able to because they have access to the alternative media. Now, this, this then spotlights the battle that awaits us today if we are to have a fighting chance at GE14. And that is a media war that needs to be taken at least to the 20% who gave them the 112 seats. We need to get them to understand at least three core messages. The first, contrary to what Amnu claims, they did not champion the fight for independence from the British. The real history, the Buranuddin Helmis, the, 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 um, the uh, trade unionists, the Tan Cheng Locks. And if, if, you, if you just study the, the, the incident of Hartal on 20th October 1947, you will begin to understand that our forefathers understood the notion of unity being blind to race and ethnicity far more than our generation does. Without the aid of cell phones, facsimile, internet, they closed the nation for one day. The power of the people when you are united. They understood it. Now, the fight that Abu takes to Amno is about the disenfranchised 40%. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly pleased to see so many Malaysians in Australia doing well. For your, I, I, I mean that. I mean that. Um, but I, I, I want to remind you that for every one of you, there are 14 who are stuck back home who haven't a hope in hell of extricating themselves from that system. Um, We need that. Because if we don't, be anyone. Now, I'm also concerned, I'm <coughs> very concerned, that much as we placed hope with the opposition as a transforming regime if we had taken Putrajaya, I'm, I'm concerned that on certain core issues, there may not be much difference between one and the other. And I, I'll spotlight this by just taking you to the issue of the minimum wage. Party Socialist Malaysia, Party Rakyat Malaysia, NGOs that have done a lot of work in researching uh, the poverty on the ground have asked for a minimum of 1,005. And to me, that's really scraping the bottom of the barrel. BN have said 900. Pakatan have said 1,001. And they both sing the same mantra in rebutting 1005 in that if we give you what you are asking for, we kill the SMEs. Now understand how the SMEs function. They are largely, especially the assembly lines, the factories, are largely driven by the foreign workforce. A Bangladeshi can afford to take a wage of 600 because he shares a room with 30 others. But the Malaysian with a wife and three kids cannot take that arrangement. So there's absolutely no way he can take such an arrangement. Now, when you have then a company that produces, say, for instance, um, 
wheels, alloy wheels, paying a, a workforce 600 per head, you can then begin to understand why the CEO is able to own three bungalows on millionaires' rows, millionaires' row, fully paid for. That's the reality. And, and, and to me, yes, this is, this is a phenomena that we are seeing globally. The 2%, 3% at the top skim the cream. And then you have the middle class. But it is the large numbers that statistically have to survive on one US dollar a day. Now, we have that in Malaysia. I, I was speaking to some police officers after I was arrested. And uh, I was sharing with them, I said that, you know, your counterparts in Singapore earn three times what you do. We have the gas, we have the petrol, we have the rubber, we have the timber, we have oil palm. They buy our water and they steal our sand. <laughs> so why are they earning more than you? And I said, I'll give you one reason. There's one thing we have that they don't. I'm no. <laughs> <laughs> That's the curse and the bane of this nation. Now, Harris, you should not be so confrontational. You should not be so in your face. I said, yes, perhaps. But we need to go to the kampongs and tell the Malays. Because this is something about the Malay culture. You put a corrupt politician in front of him and he still feels obliged to roll out the red carpet. So I said, we've got to stop this. So I go in the rallies and I call them the worst things possible. And you can't say that politely. <laughs> All right, you can't. <laughs> you can't. Um, now, that's, that's the battle we are facing now. On the one hand, in the short term, we are looking at an uncertain economic situation. If it bottoms out, as we saw in Iceland, docile the grandmothers with saucepans in front of ministers' houses saying, I have nothing to put on the table. Now, sure, Malaysians by far and large, by far and large are very, very pacific. We are pacifists. Um, the most pacifist person has his breaking point. And I've said this to middle class audiences again and again. You can support this cause either for altruistic reasons, because you see the poor and it breaks your heart, or you can do this for the most practical reason to maintain your way of life. I don't care. I really don't care what moves you. But if you do not move, and if the rate of disenfranchisement continues, the numbers will grow and they will come back and change your way of life. I've, I've had, I've had <coughs> young men tell me, say the word in Tamil, I can speak a bit of Tamil, Konja Konja Tamil Say the word and we are ready to bomb MCOP Mall. And I say, no, 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 right? But there is a seeding. And you must expect, you must expect then that when, 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 when sons from the Orang Asli settlements go to the university and begin to understand the amount of wealth that has been taken away, and you go back again and you see the abject poverty, that these feelings will begin to creep in. Now, Through Saya Anak Bangsa Malaysia and through HAKAM, which is the short for Human Rights Society of Malaysia, there is an initiative called the Social Inclusion Agenda. It was actually started through the Malaysian Civil Liberties Movement, of which I was president for a while, until my friend and I decided to take different ways. Now, as I left MCLM, I took that agenda and it has been left in the good hands of SABM 
and Hakka. Social inclusion agenda is a civil society proposal to replace the new economic policy. Last year, in September, a presentation was done where both sides of the political divide were invited to come and view. BN, as expected, no show. The political parties from Sabah came in full force. PKR, DAP were present, as were PSM and PRM, Party Socialist Malaysia, Party Riot Malaysia. Now, all the socialist parties and the parties in Sabah were fully supportive and pledged that if they were part of a new regime in Putrajaya, they would work with civil society to implement it. PKR and DAP said, oh, very nice, very good, we take it back to party leadership, and that's the last we've heard of them. Now, aside from the problem of leakages in the new economic policy, if you, if you examine how it was intended to work, it was doomed from the very outset. You have a director general who sits in his air-conditioned office with his officers, plagiarizing various programs from other jurisdictions and putting together a one shirt fits all. It's not going to work. All right? you, go to, you go to Kota Damansara, you go to the low cost flats, you have a high density of single mothers. Now you can't take that same program to them and the very same program apply to the Orang Asli in Perak. It's just not going to work. There's too high an element of paternalism in it. Uh, we know what's good for you. No, you need to go down to ground, you need to hear them out, and you need to see what their needs are, and then go back to the drawing board. That's one. More importantly, we need to take the affirmative program, any affirmative program, out of the hands of politicians. Because they see it as arming them with the power of patronage. And that's a huge problem. We have proposed a commission. We have proposed regular reports to allow for accountability and transparency. And it is for that reason that I understand the reluctance of even the political parties on the opposition side to push it forward. We want to push this to the states of Penang and Slango to say, look, you can shame the devil that Amno BN is by taking this on board. And in this regard, I think we need someone from civil society to serve as the moral compass, if you will, to take us out of the nightmare that we are. I, I, I've lost confidence in the politicians. There is too much of political expediency there rather than doing what is right. I'll give you a simple example. There is no Bumiputra in the Constitution. I see a look of surprise. There is none. You search the entire book, you will not find the word Bumiputra. It was a late 60s contrivance, all right? You keep hearing this special rights of the Malays, and they pin it on Article 153 of the Federal Constitution. Article 153 says, special position of the Malays and the indigenous of Sabah and Sarawak and the legitimate interests of the other communities. It does not create rights. What it does is, it places a duty on the Agong, the king, to safeguard all these three. The special position of Malays, special position of the indigenous of Sabah and Sarawak, and the legitimate interests of the other communities. And if you go back to the Reed Commission report, the commission that crafted and drafted that document that finally became the Constitution, they recommended that Article 153 be reviewed after 15 years. Why? Because they said, given the state of the economy then, it may be necessary. They were not totally in favor of this, and I'll tell you why. They said the Malays might need a leg up, give them a, a lift. 
and they and we said that 15 years would be sufficient. And so they said review in 15 years. And now, why do I say even they were not too happy? First of all, it appears in the language of the Reed Commission report itself. But more importantly, put things in context. Reed Commission was appointed in 1955 of yeah 56 to come up with this draft. Eight years before that, you had the UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And if you want to understand why that came about in 1948, we have just witnessed World War, the Holocaust, the attempt to exterminate the Jews, and to create a super race. Now, it is unimaginable, therefore, that this commission of eminent persons, fully aware of what the world had just witnessed, would now lay the platform to create a super race called the Malayu. That was never the intention. But when I take this to the politicians, even on the opposition side, they say, yes, we agree with you. But the Malays are not ready to hear this. I said, if I leave it to you, they will never be ready to hear this. It's not a popular message to take to ground. Of course it's not. Now, there is no room in Islam for race supremacy. And again, they say, of course, Harris, we know that. But not an easy message to take to the Malays. So this is the problem we have. First, they want to get their leg into the doorway to power. So they say, let's not talk about it now. Now, when they get their foot in the doorway, they will want to consolidate position their, their power. So they'll say, let's not talk about it now. My concern is we will never, ever talk about it if we leave it to the politicians. So, for me, it is time that a civil society leader step forward. And I can only think of two persons. Pak Samak, who is loved by all, and maybe Ka Amiga, who is also loved by all. all right? And as far as I know, they have no political aspirations. Either one or both of these would be ideal to take this message of change, to bring pressure to bear on our opposition leaders to begin to be leaders of the people rather than of their own parties. What is the role of Abu? The same. We will continue to take the message. This time, we will not wait too long. The time is now. We will take the message of change to the Malay heartlands. And that message is this. You have been lied to for the last 40 years. AMNO is not looking out for your interest from its inception to now AMNO looks out for its own. Number two, there is no Ketuanan Melayu that can sit with Islam. So decide for yourselves, are you Muslims or are you bigots? And finally, that the NEP as I said, whilst laudable in its intent, has been so abused using the platform of uplifting the lives of the Malays. They need to know the truth. Now, that can only start now. I was asked in Canberra, what if the 40% cannot wait to GE14? My answer is this, I serve the 40%, and if the 40% are prepared to come down and descend on Putrajaya in large enough numbers, then we will try to take Putrajaya before any general election. For this simple reason, with the gerrymandering, with the redelineation that is due to take place or kick off in December, uh, it may well be that the electoral playing field will never be <coughs> may never be leveled. And I, for one, personally am not ready to go to another poll knowing full well I'm going to be cheated. I see no purpose in partaking in such a futile exercise. Um, but if the 40% can wait and work their socks off, then Abu will serve them through to GE14. Now, uh, how much time do I have? 
I think I'd like to, if I can, hear from you, your questions, and see if I can answer them for you. I thank you for listening.